Well, hello, everybody. Today is Monday, February 10th, 2020. My name is Matt Fury, and you are listening to The Rough Cut. Well, hello once again. Welcome back. Good to see you or hear you or not hear you. I don't know. You're there. I know that. Maybe if you've been here before, you heard last week's episode with editor Jin Mo Yang from Parasite. That was really cool, really fun, kind of a different thing to do. I certainly enjoyed talking to Jin Mo. Um, and it's interesting. We got some comments uh, from a few people socially or in social media about uh, that it was nice to have a non-avid project on the show. And I wanted to elaborate just a little bit more about the whole concept of avid versus non-avid when it comes to the rough cut. Parasite is the only one we've done so far that wasn't cut on avid. And that's not terribly surprising for a few reasons. First, you know, there's a lot of editing choices out there to be made in terms of what you use, but most of the bigger projects in in film and television are cut on Avid. So there's that factor. And then in a way, Avid is the sort of unofficial sponsor of the podcast in that they give me a paycheck. Why? I do not know. It's probably one of those Milton from Office Space situations where they fired me years ago and forgot to stop paying me. Regardless, I get a little money every couple of weeks. And because of that, I don't have to make a living off this podcast. So when you factor in those two things, a very high percentage of the projects we cover on The Rough Cut will have been cut on Avid Media Composer. But there's no rule about that, so we'll just see how it goes. No matter what, I hope it comes through in these podcasts that I don't try and dwell too much on the product that the editors use, really more about how they use them as a means to an end for fulfilling their roles as storytellers and filmmakers. But getting back to Jinmo Yang, he's one of six very talented editors nominated for an Oscar. You've got Thelma Schoonmaker for The Irishman, Tom Eagles for Jojo Rabbit, Jeff Groth for Joker, and Mike McCusker and Andrew Buckland for Ford vs. Ferrari. And I think you already know that Jinmo and Tom Eagles won Ace Eddies for Dramatic and Comedic, respectively. And Mike and Andrew recently won a BAFTA. So this race kind of feels like it's anybody's to win. All of these folks, of course, are deserving of this consideration, but at the same time, it's kind of crazy, the whole idea of judging editing. You know, as a viewer, the person doing the judging of the editing, you only see the finished result. Maybe everything was perfect, the writing, the acting, the directing, the cinematography, and it wasn't hard to make a masterpiece, and the editor's talents weren't so much put to the test. But when any of those things is less than ideal, you have no idea what kind of unholy acts or unnatural feats the editor or editors had to pull off to deliver what you saw on the screen. Maybe the editing on a lesser film is really what's most deserving of recognition. Uh, You don't know, and that's a big part of why we do this, to get a better understanding of what these editors go through. And all that leads us to our guest today. The film Bad Boys for Life is not only in theaters right now, it is doing huge business. I'll admit I could not have predicted the success it's having. Then again, I thought Game of Thrones sounded like a dumb idea and would never work, so that shows what I know. But one of my reasons for doubting Bad Boys for Life is that it's the third film in a series, which is not unusual and certainly not a recipe for disaster. But the first film, Bad Boys, came out all the way back in 1995. And then the second one came out in 2003, Bad Boys 2. Well, here we are 17 years later. That's quite a gap, and one that won't necessarily hand-deliver an audience anxiously awaiting a sequel. But, as usual, it's the confluence of the right talent at the right time. The time is obviously now, but a big part of the talent is the editing team of Peter McNulty and Dan Leventhal. Old Dan scores a hat trick with his appearance on The Rough Cut. He's my only three-timer, with previous episodes covering Elf and Spider-Man Far From Home. Dan is a stalwart in the Marvel Universe. I think he's been at the helm for about eight of those films. That's an unofficial count, so don't quote me. So please give a big rough cut welcome, privately, wherever you may be, to today's guest, Dan Leventhal. On this one as well, you know, the directors were still around, but I was uh, given a lot of leeway. Well, unfortunately, you know, Peter's not able to join us today, but I know um, you'll be able to represent pretty well. Uh, had you two ever worked together before this film? No, no. I met uh, Peter when I arrived. I, I came on uh, right um, after their director's cut, uh, you know, to kind of help out. And this film itself, you know, you're, you're no stranger to action films, certainly the superhero genre. How would you describe the style of editing uh, you and Peter employed in this film? Um, well, you know, this is classic uh, comedy action which is absolutely in my wheelhouse and um when i came on board um a lot of good stuff was in place it uh, just needed shape 
pace and um, and a few uh, structural and narrative uh, issues uh, to be worked on. Once you joined, how did you and Peter divide the work? Was there a sort of like, okay, Dan, we're bringing you in because you're a specialist in this or just because the, the workload is, is too much for us to hit the release date? Yeah, in, in, in this case... Um, there was a there was plenty to do for everybody. I had to do a sort of an outside exploration, uh, looking at the whole picture again. I, I did what I normally do, uh, which is first thing just to get my feet wet. I do a comedy pass. Peter kept um, uh, advancing the the cut forward in terms of what the director was looking for. The directors, the uh, Adil and Bilal, and uh, so he kept working that, and we had a lot of. Um, a lot of effects things and, and a lot of uh, things that uh, were coming in. And so he, he and um, his assistant, who actually uh, became the additional editor, were given a lot of, uh, of tasks to, to uh, keep advancing. And things just kept getting better by the day while I looked on, on the outside and started kicking the tires of the, um, of the story structure and narrative myself. Well, I've never heard anybody describe a comedy pass. I mean, what do you, it, maybe it's, it's self-evident. What are you looking for or what are you doing in a comedy pass? What I'm trying to do is, um, you know, I, I have certain things I know about comedy, uh, which is uh, slightly different from um, other types of film, which is how, how to land jokes really well um, in, in a lot of cases is, is has to do with uh, pace and then um, timing of pauses. So I went about that. I mean, the the goal of the film uh, to me was first to make uh, Will Smith and and Martin look like you know the guys of old. Uh, the, the the chemistry and the banter, the way they talk back and forth. And so a little bit of work had to be done just to to sort of try to find that place that everyone knew and loved. And, and, you know, we knew that the, the heart of this film is that those two being the bad boys rather than e- each individual. So try to get back to that place. Was that harder than it might usually be? Because I think what's, what's extraordinary about this film is the, the, the gaps between the films. I think in 1995, Bad Boys comes out, then Bad Boys 2 in 2003. So already have eight years there. And now it's 17 years later. There's... You know, you've got to remind people who these guys are. You've got to really work to to build up that um, that feeling about them. Yeah, you, and you you do you you want them to get that familiarity. At the same time, the the writers were very smart in advancing the uh, story, not trying to actually make these guys those guys from nineteen and twenty five years ago, but to to say, well, here's the here's an older version of them. But that said, you still want that chemistry to feel the same. So I, I did a lot of work, um, especially on Martin's character, to give him that kind of energy as, in as much as you can. And so sometimes that involves throwing out uh, some jokes that may not work or putting, putting more pace to what he, what he was doing, like you know, getting rid of hems and haws and just making it just that sort of snappy back and forth banter. So you talked about, you know, wanting to make this seem familiar. In what ways did you or or did you try and make it feel different? Did you want this film to be different in some way, shape or form from the first two? Um, I thought that uh, it it should first as- aspire to get us back to where it was. But yeah, it, it, it had its own, you know, I, I kind of have a a higher uh, narrative threshold, and it may be all the all the Marvel time where we keep fighting to get uh, story beats right and in place, and sort of, you know, it was it was sort of translating that kind of uh, editing muscle that I had from all those kind of films into this, which had similar problems, uh, the classic bad guy problems that we always deal with in the Marvel, and how to how to really work that because your good guys can't be really good unless your bad guys are, are formidable. So um, much work on that kind of thing to, you know, to get it to be um, a little bit more than the original ones were because the, the threshold of what they were looking for isn't as high as it is today. 
So sometimes you do films with new people, like in this case with Peter, but more often than not, there tends to be a, a crew that forms that travels from film to film. Certainly your assistant, Don Michelle King, um, forever to be immortalized as the voice of Edith in Spider-Man Far From Home, um, but also Tony Lamberty and Steve Tickner, who did sound editing and mixing for both Spider-Man and Bad Boys for Life. I know when we talked back in the Spider-Man time frame, you had discussed implementing a pretty forward-looking picture-to-sound post-process on Spider-Man. And with you three still intact here in this film, did you employ that here as well? Well, I came on too late to do it. I Strangely, I had mentioned it to Jerry Bruckheimer, and he said, do it, do it now. And I was like, I can't do it, it's too late. We're too far in to, to uh, switch to that uh, agile uh, kind of format that uh, created for uh, Spider-Man Far From Home. Um, but I'm, I'm told that Lee's using it on uh, Black Widow. So I, I look forward to doing it again. So Steve, Steve Tickner and I had to kind of go back to the old methods um, with the, the stops for previews and all that kind of stuff. So for people that haven't had a chance to hear the original Dan Leventhal Spider-Man podcast, um, just sort of do a, a quick reset, if you will, as to what this new process is that you found that worked really well for Spider-Man. Well, the, the central issue is that... Um, when we when we go to preview films for audiences, you generally had in the in the classic sense had to stop at a certain date, um, lose a couple days of editing time to go and mix to show one screening, and then you go back and keep going with not a lot that happens for that mix to translate into further cuts. So uh, it's a built-in inefficiency, and mixing days are expensive. So at Marvel, we, we were never given the time to do temp mixes because the craziness of the schedule meant that we had to <clears throat> sort of put it together um, in, in front of us. Well, I'm not a mixer. So after developing this system, I finally figured out what we do is bring in an embedded mixer, have him actually work on a media composer with the simultaneous Pro Tools, but having the media composers the lead so we wouldn't lose our uh, ability to constantly have our dialogue tracks up to date. And so he was sit sitting there chasing us the whole time. And so every day when I'd make a change, that night he would remix it in. So we had a, a constant state of a mixed film in terms of previews, not in terms of final, because much more goes into a final. But for us, it made it so agile and we were able to work, you know, till five o'clock the previous day and then put up a, a screening the next day. So it was awesome. So was there any reticence or hesitancy on the part of Steve or Tony or anybody in the sound team with this with this new thing you were proposing? Uh, there was a lot of resistance and there was even resistance from the studio because you, you can't change a studio culture, uh, you know, post-production. But once we did it, everyone was like, wow, well, this is what we need. Um, I think um, had Bad Boys uh, started later, they would have, uh, that, you know, Sony would have realized how awesome that is, uh, what we had done, and maybe implemented it a bit. But it started while we were still finishing um, Spider Man, so they were already in place with using the older methods. Well, we know that your experience in, in quote-unquote superhero movies is well-documented. You illustrated a little bit about the bad guy problem, but how does a, a straight-ahead action movie like Bad Boys compare to something like an Iron Man or a Spider-Man? I, th I think it's, it's similar um, in that I think this, is, this kind of movie is still in the, the realm of, of a bit of fantasy. Obviously, police don't go around shooting people um, and joking, <laughs> so... Depends where you live, I suppose. Yeah, these things are these things are sort of, you know, uh, built in. These are sort of superheroes without being superheroes. Now, the thing, just like in a superhero movie, the better you ground them as real people, the better the the uh, you know the outrageous powers and things look. So these guys can be super cops, and you know, having motorcycle chases with three sixties. That's sort of their superpower in their own way. Um, so, so it's kind of, it kind of really related to me. Um, then it was just giving the human parts, you know, really good poignancy. A lot was in place that Peter had already done. And in fact, he had already done the funniest scene in the movie. And when you come onto a movie 
even if you're given the authority to do things, the smartest thing you can do is not screw up something that's working. Right. So you kind of can you kind of look at it, maybe kick the tires for a second, but go, well, he's really got this. This is this is really great. And and you know, don't be in your own ego, but have the uh, vision to see what what's really been put in place that's well. And and so that's why uh, Peter and I could have an excellent and honest partnership because he knew I wasn't about to ruin all the great work he did. And then he could keep doing great work. And then I could go and look and suggest and, and try things. So we ended up with a really good back and forth. Was there anything that you would, you know, sometimes when you've worked with somebody for the first time, you discover something about their process or their technique, anything you picked up from him when you, when you started working with him? Look, I'm always picking up from people. I'll steal from anyone. You know, whenever I see, whenever I see, oh, well, that's a good technique. You know, him, him and uh, Blair, um, his, his uh, assistant slash additional editor on this, were doing some amazing graphics work. Because uh, we had tons of graphics to get into all this stuff inside monitors and finding ways to communicate the story inventing um you know a whole outside world theme that that something that i suggested we needed to bring in that they executed so their techniques were excellent so i just uh, put that in the back of my playbook for the future well it's funny you brought up the um the graphics and the monitors because that's one thing that stood out to me as i was watching the film there's a lot of you know because they're superhero cops like you talked about there are a lot of shots whether they're inserts or, or in the scene of computer monitors cell phones things like that and as I was watching them, I was thinking, things have come a long way in terms of technology. When you were starting out, I imagine those things had to be done in post and inserted. But is it possible now for a lot of this stuff to be done ahead of time and it's, it's actually there on set and it's a practical effect? Yeah, there's, uh, there's absolutely some practical effects that were, that were good. But just remember, if they're shooting it and they're trying to get the actor's timing, they can't be so concerned with that stuff. So there's often a, a, a base layer or there'll be blue screen in the monitors or whatever. And then we figure, but even more than that, we, we had to invent language. Again, I suggested a lot of things. I, I helped restructure the whole way the, the bad guy story would be revealed, but I didn't necessarily execute that. I would say, okay, we're going to do this and this and this. And the, the directors were super keen on that. You know, they, they had they had wanted to do a lot of these things, and strangely enough, me being put on actually allowed them to do things that they weren't necessarily able to do because of um, you know um, you know basically feelings from the studio or the producers that you know if then I suggested well we need this because of this and this they they actually got to do a lot of what they really wanted to do, which was great. That was great for them. Well, I'm glad you brought up your influence on the story and the structure because the film starts with that, with a high-speed driving sequence, and which we'll get into in a little bit. And then it's followed up by a few other scenes that are there to set up the antagonist or antagonists for the film. And in those three scenes, those first three scenes, I was thinking about how those played out and that it felt like creatively you could have led with any of those scenes and the audience would have had the same information but the tone of the film might have started off feeling different. I know that editors often talk about the difficulty of finishing a film, but script aside, is starting a film just as difficult? And was there any sort of play in those first three scenes? There, there was a lot. There was so much discussion. The, the, the driving was great, um, and the jokes were good, but there was concern whether or not the, the first jokes would land high enough that... Um, that, that when things turn a little bad, that you can sustain it till you get back to that part of the movie. And, you know, we, we all have, uh, editors have our words for that part of the structure, which it, it's going to hit the sag, um, you know, or the valley or whatever. So you, you want to kind of load, load up a little bit before then so that you can get through that part till you're getting to back to the thing that you know the audience really enjoys, which is them you know, being bad boys doing the thing. So therefore, a lot went in um, uh, and a lot went out, to be honest, uh, you know, to, to shrink it down to manageable size. And even then, there was concern until it was deemed, oh, well, this is going to be a credit sequence. 
which then gives you a little more leeway to just sort of have fun without having the full audience judgment on it. At first, we talked about a main on end, which is putting the, uh, the, the main credits at the end of the movie. But we decided, well, this, this sort of solves uh, uh, two things. It, it lets our, our compressed um, action beginning have that role. So it's, it's not like, uh, yeah, there was so much concern about being judged against the excellent action that Michael Bay always does. So mm. yeah, I know the directors were so concerned with that. And my concern was just, you know, getting this tight opening that has the right tone and then uh, setting it up to get through the sag. Well, that opening sequence, that opening credit sequence, it has, it has the guys, you know, racing to get to get to the hospital underneath the credits Generally, with an opening credit sequence, especially one that that stands on its own, an editor is dedicated to doing that sequence or sequences. Because this was part of the film, uh, I'm going to assume that you know Peter and or you were tasked with this at one point. Is there anything about cutting under a title sequence that you have to consider, or do you just cut the way you're going to cut and they make the credits work for how you cut it? Yeah, that had an interesting evolution. Um, I am told that. They, they had a very big uh, action second unit director who did a first pass on, I think, that and the motorcycle. Then Peter and, and Blair then did it, um, did those. Then I came in, and I, I kind of redid that and uh, shwoke it, then handed it back to Peter and Blair, who then um, uh, evolved it, you, you, sort of using what everyone had done. So, you're, you're again, you don't want to throw away what's working. You want to... You want to look at things and add to them. And, you know, if, if you're going to go, well, I have, to, I have to do everything different just to appear like I'm important, boy, you're really, you're really asking for it. You're asking uh, to have, you know, n- not the best sequence. So everyone contributed to that sequence to get it there. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, you know, for me, when I first got on, there were three three there were three songs over it it was much longer and i was like well you can't do that you just can't do that you have to make this thing all one and in fact i kind of even thought maybe even making it tighter so that when you hit the you know the main joke is that uh he's gonna he's uh he's having a baby that's why they're racing Mm -hmm. well it ended up even you know even a compromise for me it ended up sort of a two thing because the the funniest thing was banging the car door so we arrived at that, but it just couldn't, it couldn't be its own full movie. So there's a lot of evolution and everyone had their hand in it. And we haven't talked about this in a while, but didn't you get your start well, early on in your career doing a lot of music videos? Sure. That's, sure. That must've played out well here. Yeah, it, it did. I mean, it, it, it meant that uh, I understood all that and what they're doing. Although I, I'll, I'll say on this film, because I was doing my thing with, um, so many aspects of it. I stayed out of the music realm a bit, and the directors are so strong on that. They they really had their you know young sensibilities, and so I, I used a little of uh, of those skills, but kind of kept that gun in the holster a little bit to you know while I was uh, you know off on my own, not not wanting to be a you know a hog on the whole film. <laughs> Well, in the film, there are, and th- this is sort of evocative of the whole music video thing, I guess, uh, lots of speed ramps in the movie, slowing things down, speeding things up, doing both back to back. Are those moments planned out ahead of time because they are very stylized, or do you find those in the editing room? Um, that, it's both, because the directors were really interested in that. So they had done these uh, films in Belgium, and they were really into, into it. In fact, the whole movie is shot at 48 frames per second. So you have almost everything. See, it's some some even even higher frame rate, meaning slow motion, meaning to get back to just regular dialogue, you have to double the speed in post. So um, they're really into that kind of thing. And for me, the the big thing was that, like, well, let's do it, but be judicious because if you do say seven slow mo shots in a row. Slow mo doesn't mean anything. It's just it's just what you're it's just what you're doing, mm. um, especially in the middle of an action sequence. So what you want in general in editing is you want your your the things you do to come out special, right? 
if you do all close-ups in a row, close-ups mean nothing. If you do a bunch of wide shots, you start to get bored. It's in mixing it. It's like a prize fighter. It's in mixing your punches. It's in doing things differently. So for me, they had all these things, and some of them, some of them were great. And then I was like, well, this is great, but let's let's be judicious and 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 go and uh, use it here and not use it. So as much for me was pulling back, and they're they're so into it that uh, they could help find the ramps. Some some of them I did myself. Uh, just because if we were, um, you know, re-editing a sequence, you wanted to keep it within the aesthetic of what they've been doing. But if the movie's running longer when time is tight, are those easy candidates to cut out those little bits? Or, or do you not cut them out? You just dial up the speed even faster? Well, you know, it's case by case. It's, it's, it's more the feeling of, uh, well, this scene is uh, past its, uh, you know, expiration date. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, yeah, you just take it. You take it case by case. But there was, there was some tremendous action that was just too much, and you know, I could see it in the reaction of the audiences that, oh, okay, this is all amazing action, and now they're starting to disengage. And so, what you do is you, you, you know, you take it to its limits. There's old saying: make them want more, not not less. So you you, you find that place. And now within that, you use those ramps and those exciting slow-mos to, to be your peaks and, and all that. And then you don't use them for the mundane moment. That's, that's my point. Okay. Well, so let's, let's dig into the whole style thing a little bit more because uh, you also have a lot of transitions that are heavily stylized. When you're cutting, and this maybe goes back to your whole comedy pass idea, but when you're cutting, is your process just to lay down straight cuts to do the assembly um, and then get the story tight and then you go back and do the sizzle bits or are those things so essential to a film like this that you're, you're on them from the very beginning? Okay. So because I came in late, much of that was in place. I, I'm, I think that that comes from the directors and, and from Peter and, and, uh, and his team having put that style of transition. Some of it was necessary because the structure of the film sometimes had, um, one, uh, one, you know, Martin and Will moment to the next. So they needed to do one of those like swish wipe kind of things. Mm. So they had that. So then when I came on, I would just keep to that aesthetic. So I'm not claiming any of that. It's not like in some of the other films that we've talked about that I've done like Ant-Man where I just totally did that stuff. Let's just say in general, let's say if you had started on this film or maybe just not even specific to Bad Boys for Life, is it the kind of thing where you would almost do an offline cuts only radio edit and then you save the, 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 the finesse transition stuff till the end, or do you work that stuff initially just to see how it'll work in the scene? Um, a, a little of both, but, but generally speaking, when you're starting a film and doing an assembly, uh, they, remember they're not shooting in order. So you're building things on its own. Mm. And, and usually, usually what you do with, scenes during the assembly is they get their like you try to make them the biggest scene most important scene in the movie so you're not yet thinking transitions you may start to find them and start to build the aesthetic for later but at first you're you're just giving whole scenes with beginnings middles and ends as you keep editing it down you start to lose uh beginnings and ends and just and just try to look for flow and uh, so a lot of that part comes when you're trying to get flow. Okay, so along those lines, oftentimes in the film, you will intercut between scenes that are taking place in different locations. The characters of Mike and Marcus, played by Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, they get split up. Um, but when, And when you're cutting back and forth uh, between those scenes that are playing out with characters that are in different locations, or, or could even be at different times, will you cut those as individual scenes first on their own and then do the intercutting, or will you treat it like one big scene and just sort of cut it linearly? It depends on the case, but absolutely, I, I've in you know throughout my career, I've built it in, in terms of modules because the the way they're writing and shooting it, they can't give you the exact cross cut it's going to be, and the way you shoot it often does uh, combine scenes, even if there are suggested cross cut by the writer. So oftentimes, I would build a module. Uh, for each thing and then start to fold them in like a deck of cards. But it, it really depends, you know, uh, you know, every, every movie has its own thing one has to do. Now on this one, again, Peter had already done a, a tremendous amount of it. 
I mean, I the the biggest thing I had to kind of really attack and and rebuild were were like uh, the whole end battle and uh, a bit on the motorcycle sequence too. Had to had to kind of attack that. What you do is that you know you you kind of build this and then you start to suggest things and then everyone else's mind comes in and starts. Oh, okay. Well, we have this and this too. Well, that big end battle and certainly the motorcycle is an extended motorcycle chase, um, emblematic of the kind of things, uh, these big intense set pieces you have in action movies. They could be, again, car chases, shootouts, some kind of race against the clock to save the world. And then those are all backed up by scenes that provide the context for the goal of those set pieces and the consequences the heroes will face if they fail. Um, Not to mention that it gives you an opportunity to play up dramatic and comedic moments that aren't really possible in chase scenes. Um, do you have a personal preference for either type of cutting or either type of scene to work on? Um, I, I love the combination of action and comedy. I, I love how it works. I mean, it's, that's been sort of, uh, one of my calling cards all along here. I mean, when you think about even back in Iron Man, that's, that's what's going on here. Um, you know, we would always resolve, uh, action scenes with comedy. So it, it's great. And, and in fact, um, there was a there was a realization actually it was by Will Smith himself you know he'd come in the editing room a lot and he was very brilliant himself and uh, there was a realization that the motorcycle chase scene was missing um, a huge a huge joke which is the uh, the the one where he uh, said God gave you the gun there was like a two sentence thing there but it, it needed to be the principal you know, funny and funny moment in that. And be, and the scene always felt like, well, this is satisfying action, but it's not satisfying for the movie until, until we went on additional photography and really made that a, a huge moment. And then you kind of get a rhythm in these movies, right? You almost know that there's an interval. If you've gone too far from comedy in your action, you're really hurting it. Unless you're, unless you're, in the poignancy moment. So that's a whole different thing. You, you have you, the moments of extreme poignancy, and that's why people are relating to this movie because it's got all three of them going on. So that, then, then you, you, don't, you try not to do it, although it is fun to take the piss out of even the poignant moments. So uh, you look for that. I, I love the interplay between comedy and other things. Uh, that's, that's my favorite. Well, that motorcycle scene, it's, it's a great, or scenes, I don't know how you describe it. It's a, it it, it's a big moment in the film, and you're right, that whole, it hinges on that comedic beat within it. Um, but one thing that always strikes me about scenes, or sequences, I should say, like that, is the challenge of keeping the audience oriented. Because they're just, you know, people are flying all over the place, they're zipping around through the city. Do you find continuity to be especially challenging in working on something like that? Or do you just throw it out the window and say, you know what, it's, just, it's a roller coaster ride and nobody's going to pay attention to that? I, at first I was like, no one cares, but then, it, you know, the deeper you actually look, you don't necessarily see it at first, but there is geography, right? Mm-hmm. So you want to make, you want to make, you don't have to adhere to um, the, you know, the shoe leather concept of how he got from here to here, but you don't want at the same time, what we always call the ham sandwich where, where the scenes going later and the sandwich is getting bigger, you know? <laughs> so, so, uh, so you you, you want to you want to kind of keep keep an eye on it, but not be a slave to it because a, a strong cut to you know thirty seconds down the road is absolutely acceptable, and the audience doesn't think twice. So I, I'd get you know I would do I would do some of that, jump it forward, and do this and that, and and uh, at first it's shocking to the you know to the directors and. The people, but then everyone was like, "Oh yeah!" After a little while, they forget there was ever even anything in between those things. How would you rate the amount of what I would call invisible editing that goes on in this film? It felt like there was, and by that I'm, I'm talking about like so that the intra frame editorial stuff that often goes on with things like fluid morph, because it felt like there was a lot of action in the foreground, even in simple scenes like you know Will Smith talking down to to Joe Pants, Joe Pantoliano. Um, you have people walking in front of them, which opens up an opportunity for what I always call waiter wipes. Is there a lot of that going on or did that really not happen? Yeah, there's, so some, there's some of that going on. It's funny you mentioned uh, Fluid Morph, which has been in the media composer forever. Um, I think I only found out about that thing 10 years ago, even though it's been in there forever. 
But I did a couple and they were like, wait, wait. They were like, cause they, cause the, the directors and, and, and Peter hadn't heard of it. It's a, it's a funny thing about the media composer is that there's, there's hundreds of things that even we, I've been on it for 30 years and you still don't know of it. Right. But I did them and they're like, how'd you do that? What'd you do <laughs> to compress some of like, um, uh, Martin Lawrence's, uh, you know, dialogue, because there's, you know, you got to watch out for those long pauses. <laughs> so, yeah, we'd have a lot of little, little things intra frame. Um, I think that's just normal now. It's just like every film is an effects film now. You, you know, even Little Women is full of effects. Everything has effects. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you, you know, people who lambast effects films, you know, they're like, but you're doing effects films. <laughs> so, it's got to yeah, be in everybody's bag of tricks now. Yeah, I mean, you you just do. It's part of the story t- storytelling thing. Um, and interframe is very important. You know, manipulating um, things that you know that make making frames. You know, I did some some uh, classic uh, split screens in the car where the you know the, I I need uh, this reaction to this and and then. The effects teams are so used to it. You just you just kind of do it a little, you know, you know, kind of just go here. Here are the things I want to work together and make a way for it to be smooth. Yeah. So you do a lot of that. So I I, I figured the film would do well. I got to admit that I was surprised at how well it it has done and is continuing to do. And it seems like maybe you guys already had an idea of that because there is a there's a sequel, what I'll call tag at the end of the film. Was that always there? Or was that, did you, when there was a strong feeling of wishful, confidence or? <laughs> I think that was wishful thinking. Yeah. The, 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 I think the funny thing is you just never know. And cause these movies, the first two are actually quite beloved, but they're say their reviews on Rotten Tomatoes are terrible. Right. right? And so I just said, I think we, I think, I think we're way, I think we'll get much higher uh, critical than the first two. And I was hoping it would get higher box office, but there's no way <clears throat> it, it was tracking people. The marketing teams did a wonderful job. I'll say that. And I guess the new way they know is um, by the number of likes on the, on the trailers on social media. Oh. So this is, this is the brave new world that, that how how they can determine and it was tracking well but not like what it did it was like it it just sort of gained steam the last uh you know two weeks before it was released so i got to give the folks in marketing over at sony just such a just such a big shout out but you know that stuff will get people into the theater but if the film isn't good it's just gonna have a weekend and die right so it's our job to make it good you mentioned um one more traditional thing that, that you use to track how well a film is going to do, and that's audience test screenings. What was your level of involvement with that? Because I'm often surprised how much work editors have to do just for those alone. Well, yeah, I mean, we had, uh, what do we have? I think eight. We would have, okay, <laughs> not to get too into the weeds of the politics of this thing, but there was a huge disagreement about the ending. And the most, probably the most fascinating editorial thing that, I was uh, doing on this thing was um, the evolution of the ending because there was two very opposed schools between um, uh, studios and filmmakers and about what could what could actually be in this thing. In the end, uh, in the end, we 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 even had additional photography for two different endings. In the end, what it is is it's all folded in. It's it's basically three different shoots all folded together to make to make this grand finale, and it was crazy how it, it's a sort of a almost like a, it was almost like a fun intellectual challenge to me to see if you could actually fold these all into each other, which were actually quite different, and then do a lot of intraframe editing, what we were just talking about, to to um, to make things that weren't necessarily shot together. And this is the finale where, uh, you know, the, the bad guy gets it, you know, right. That was a major one. And it, it, it took a, a, the majority of these uh, previews were to try to get a satisfying ending. In the end, it just scored through the roof in the final preview. 
So you go, okay, well now we, we got him. Cause the end, you know, it's like, it's like your, uh, your school days where the, the final, the final test is half the grade, <laughs> you know, it's how you, how you finish and then how you leave them tonally is going to be a big part of how people, if, if you've got them throughout the rest of the film, it's still the biggest part of the score. Well, so more often than not, you've talked about um, about pacing and this the, the theory of sag or running into these lulls or valleys. You hear people just offhandedly talk about, oh, the film had trouble in the second act or things really came together in this act. Do do editors or filmmakers even really still think that way? Do you still discuss acts in post-production? Uh, in, in a lot of rooms, we do. I don't remember if, I think I was a little bit discussing it, but I don't remember anyone else doing it. Um, what was really interesting for me, yeah, we it, like in the Marvel movies, we do it a lot. The you know the classic act structure uh, is interesting for me. I got a lot of um, working time with uh, Chris Bremer, the writer, that we would sit and I would download to him, and then he would use his brain to help us solve these things. Um, a lot of them we were able to solve editorially, and the rest went into the additional photography. And the additional photography was quite short they weren't given much time but what got done you know the little glue that that makes it all work was, was extraordinary so uh, and it it really helped that we had uh, two directors because those guys were like maniacs we could divide and conquer and do you know get twice as much as two very energetic directors so you know with two very you know so they would get more than any one by themselves and then between two of them, we would get four days was like 10 days. <laughs> so it was great. Well, along the lines of um, additional photography, I, I caught something in the credits that I hadn't recalled seeing before. And I wanted to ask you what this what it was all about. Um, under second unit, there was a credit for editor in second unit. What does an editor of the second unit do? How do they fit into the grand scheme? Okay. So I, I, I apologize that I don't know the second unit director's name, but I know He's, he's considered one of the premier ones and does the um, uh, Fast and Furious movies and all that. And in his own contract, he has his own editor. So what happens is he, he shoots, shoots uh, some of the big action sequences. Uh, I, think, I think either two, you know, the, either two or three of them. I, forget, I can't forget, uh, remember what. But uh, then he, he and his editor do the first pass with the logic that people don't necessarily understand what his plan was. And that's great. I mean, it's so, it makes it so much easier. It's not, it, it, don't look at it as the actual cut that's going to be in the film, but it's the map to what he did because there's all these little pieces and you don't necessarily know what that was for. So basically, uh, Rather than the whole, the whole like frustrating and and just time consuming thing of trying to figure out, you know, what what is this, you know, on the accelerator? What is this for? What is the, you know, this swish across uh, this thing? Now they'll go ahead and put that together, and it'll be, you know, it'll be really long. It'll be the whole damn thing. But we then know from that, we'll still then take that and we'll we'll edit it to the size and, and re-edit it and re-edit it again and again and then steal parts that were here and put them there but it gives us the initial map and and i i love that well it sounds like peter certainly did a really lot of great work ahead of time because the film as we've discussed just is performing unbelievably well and you came in and helped you know help drive one out of the park this is a big weekend before we wrap things up the oscars I have to ask you, and you don't have to answer, but any predictions on on who will win, and any or any preferences as to who you'd like to see win? Well, I, you know, we we all have our favorites, and I won't say any names, uh, McCusker, and uh, you know, I sure like that uh, Ford versus Ferrari. Movie. Wait, you think it's got a you think it's got a chance, or do you think it might get well, edged out? It, it won the BAFTA, so it, it it really does have a chance, but you know. People are loving Parasite, which was excellent. And it's a really good year. I got to say that. It is. I'm really, jealous is of all really. these guys, these guys who walk up and down aisles and get statues while I just do my, you know, hit film kind of stuff. So, uh, you know. Can't have everything, Dan. I know. I know. But 
it's it's a very jealous time of year for me. I, well, I, your day will come, I'm sure. <laughs> and the Oscar goes to Michael McCusker and Andrew Buckland. This is the first Oscar and nomination for Andrew Buckland. This is also the first win and second nomination for Michael McCusker. Well, it won't win you any awards, Dan, but but you are my only th three timer on this podcast. This is your third third time dropping by, so there is that. Well, well, there you have it. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll get a fourth and a fifth in there too. I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm pretty sure we will. Wow! Congratulations, Mike and Andrew, and congrats to all the nominees. I think I speak for everyone when I say I look forward to seeing what you do next. A big thank you to Dan for talking with us about Bad Boys for Life. Maybe we'll do a sequel to this podcast when they do the next Bad Boys movie. And if it's another 17 years away, I don't know. I can't think that far ahead. One year at a time for me. And that works out great when you subscribe to Avid Media Composer. You see, I'm getting better at this. Yes, you can do a one-year subscription to Avid Media Composer for way less than you probably think. So see for yourself. There's a link to the Avid store in the show notes. In all likelihood, there's a link to a few things in the show notes, so make sure you read them. Believe me, it takes me way longer to write them than for you to read them. At least I certainly hope it does. If I'm going to keep writing these show notes, I have to keep making podcasts for which to write them. Don't worry, I'm on it. While I go do that, you go do what it is you do, and together we will reunite here once again. On that note, this is Matt Fury thanking you, like I always do, for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. <laughs>